Need I say more? <laughs> <laughs> I always talk in Yupik because I want you folks to hear our language actually being spoken. I came in with a very proper song called Yugiyam Mausagamka, which translates to My People, I Come to You. My People, I Come to You. My People, I Simply Come to You. From ancient times, people came during ceremonies uh, humbly, with reverence, and all of that, and they would sing songs as such to bind everyone together, the audience and the performers in a mutual uh, respect. And uh, I came in in my traditionals. Uh, this is a young man's garment. And as long as I have it, I'll always be a young man. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take very good care of it. So, and it's not 60 below zero, I really need to get out of it. <laughs> it's very warm. How do you spell relief? <laughs> <laughs> this was made for me by one of my late aunts. She did the body work of the piece. I did the traditional designs according to grandmother's instructions. My grandmother lived to be 95. She was born 1900. 
So she's the one who I give absolute credit to whatever I'm saying at the moment, because it is from those elders we got all our information. Each garment has a name. This garment is called Kaiyahutalk, one with armbands. Kajitkhaluni, because we have allegiance to Bristol Bay in my family. So you put on your garments who you have allegiance to in those times. So the moment they look at you, you don't even have to open your mouth. They know exactly who you are <laughs> by your designs. So it's very important designs on this uh, young man's garment. And a hundred, I'll be a young man if I take good care of it. Thank you to the museum here, allowing me to uh, come and present to you and to look at our Yupik materials. Um, I wanted you to see, you know, we're so used to masks in a museum or hanging somewhere or hanging on the wall but they were accompanied by parkas, by dance vests, by belts, by proper shoes. They were all accompanied by that in ceremony. So I wanted you to at least see our ceremonial wear where these masks were accompanied with, because they don't exist in and of themselves. It's everything is in concert together. So that's the way uh, uh, we Yupiks do it. I brought a doll today here, by the way. This was made by my late aunt again. This is called a witness doll. We bring dolls into the ceremonial realm. Sometimes you would hang them from the rafters or we would put them somewhere on the side of the ceremonial house, somewhere on the side where nobody will bother them. But what this doll is doing at this very moment in time is witnessing everything that's happening here, all the proceedings. So my words be true. It's a witness doll. My doll, uh, my aunt in her day, uh, became very well known for her dolls because, as you can see, she made them very lovingly and to the exact standards of the, of the ceremonial dolls. In fact, uh, in her day, please come on in. In her day, she was uh, commissioned by one of our governors here in our state to create seven dolls. It was no easy task for her to make seven of these. Mm -hmm. It took quite a long time. So during some sort of a function in Juneau, um, they were handed out as state gifts at some point. So my aunt, my late aunt, has that distinction of having made dolls for the state of Alaska. Please give my late aunt a big hand. <laughs> This one is wearing a Politok parka. There's one example of it right in that glass case over there where the parkas are in the same style as this doll. We also had a doll festival, which adults brought dolls into the ceremonial realm, into the, into the house. And right in front of their children, the adults played with the dolls. The dolls would go packing water, they would chop wood, they would cook. All the mundane things we have to do day, day in and day out. But that activity was telling the children was that everyday things are very important tasks we must do on a daily basis. That was part of the festival we held. In, in old Yupik language, we call that the mothering time. So 
So we're going to put her here so she's going to keep witnessing the whole event. Okay? Okay. These are men's dance bands, which we call Tahuya Mahutat. And these are the women's. But guess what? Women have rights to these. <laughs> and guess what? Men have rights to these. We were a very egalitarian culture after all. So for the next piece, I'm going to exercise my rights in using these women's dance bands. And these are made of the long beard of the caribou. The center part is made of uh, seagrass. And then my aunt employed uh, seal gut that are uh, dyed as part of the design integrated into the dance fans. Each of those designs is a ceremonial house. You're looking at it from a bird's eye view, looking down into the window, which is on top of a structure right there. There are four ceremonial houses. In other words, there's eight ceremonial houses on this piece. Old style men's headdress with feathers and seal skin. Night time has come to me. Darkness has come to me. Night time has come to me. Darkness has come to me. But the moon came to me and made me happy. My people who look at me, my ancestors back there, who look back at me, everyone is in the moon and they swing back and forth and they are truly happy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was the first composition ever allowed by the Catholic Church to be performed within the confines of the Catholic sanctuary as a funerary piece. Um, one of our elders, uh, at the death of his son, was compelled to have this song performed for his beloved son. At his own passing, we danced this for him as well. It is a public piece, therefore I'm showing it to you today. Uluwanga, elak suko. Uluwanga, tangari tanga. Uluwanga, tangari tanga. Uluwanga, iralumo tanga. Nunaneri. Ayah, <laughs> Yugi yama tanghanga kingula ramsi kingyara kingai rami tikani alu yarlinga nani ni tanga ya ay ya unu wanga unu 
our belief that they're always with us and we are always within their reach uh, so if we need help from them uh, they're there for us the materials are that are on the table are the uh, epic materials collected all the way from 1890s the latter part of 1890s and on our ceremonial where it was incredible even to run into pottery from my home area right on our river. Very few pots survive because of the cold freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw. They just crumble away uh, into dust. But this one was collected and there is that example of our ancient pottery. In ancient language of our forebears, pottery is called kiku. That's how we call our pottery, kiku. So that's our ancient kiku right there. Um, also, we help to identify this piece. For over 100 years, people have been wondering, what on earth is this? <laughs> In Yupik, we call this weef kwak, the rounded one. Uh, it's because uh, the hood, the hat, is made in a circular fashion. And it was made of Arctic squirrel and wolf and wolverine and all of that. But guess what? All the fur had been eaten away. But guess what? Because all the fur is eaten away by the bugs, we are now privy to the construction. You can see how it's constructed. So it's, it's very amazing to see the construction when all the fur had been eaten. So you know, there's always a positive thing, <laughs> even though some things have happened. <laughs> so, see, in Yupik, that's what we do. We look for things that we must improve things in. Try to be positive. So this is an ancient style, young man's boys uh, 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 with cock the hood. I mean uh, the, the, the hat. I have two of these from my childhood that my grandmother had made me. That's why I was able to identify all the little designs on it for you folks here in the museum. Every little element on this, by the way, has names in you. Yeah? Okay. This talk was billed as to talk about the European um, people who came to our world and were intrigued by our artifacts. Uh, but uh, I'd rather talk about these. You can read it in the book about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the new book uh, which was published called Yo. Henri Matisse, Henri Matisse, and the Interactive Spirit. Uh, the Matisse family owned a Yupik uh, mask, actually. Um, it's now housed in New York. Uh, when Henri Matisse's son died, his widow sold it back to our country, and it's now housed in uh, uh, Cooperstown, New York, upstate New York. 
Incidentally, that's where the baseball uh, <laughs> hall of fame and the museum is in Cooperstown, New York. And right next to it is the, some of the wonderful you big masks in another museum called the Fenimore Museum. And uh, that piece was the, the crane mask. Uh, and the made to it is also housed in the National Museum of the American Indian uh, in Washington, D.C. So the Europeans, just to give you a very quick synopsis of what this publication is about, especially the surrealists were very amazed by our Yupik masks because of the complexity of our uh, mask making with all the appendages and all the designs integrated into the masks. Um, so that's where their fascination was. And it should be because the surrealists are about dreams and the inner workings of the mind. Many of our masks came from the visions of our medicine men and women. They would dream a mask, and then they would go to a mask maker or a good carpenter and say, would you carve this, this way, that way? This is, this is my dream. This is, this is a, a medicine man's dream. Um, each village had a very good carver, so people would know who to go to. To, uh, to have something carved properly for them. Uh, each village had those folks uh, who would know how to put this together without even so much instruction. Because by the way, we've been around in Alaska for 30 centuries. Over time, there's a blueprint in our heads of what we make. It's in there. We carry our blueprints with us. Everywhere I go, I carry my blueprints with me, my Yupik blueprints with me, everywhere I go. So people knew how to put things together from the blueprints in here. So, so there it is. Oh, by the way, this is my grandmother. I gave her a lot of credit. She was, she raised me actually and my parents were next door when I was growing up. My mother was like my big sister, because <laughs> my grandma raised me. So uh, uh, she, was, she, was my, she was my mother. I was next door, my parents. Yeah. I was looking through this book that I brought with me, and I suddenly realized that uh, a um, number of years ago, I, I used to uh, uh, work with Holland America as an artist in residence, which was organized out of Anchorage through the uh, Heritage, the New Heritage Center. So they sent me on a few trips with Holland America. On one of my first trips, uh, Early in the morning, the captain said, we're passing Kayak Island. <laughs> Kayak Island was the first island sighted by Vitas Berry on his voyage to our, our country. So I ran out, <laughs> and there it was. And I, and I didn't realize, I forgot, I wrote this afterwards. And if you will, I, I would like to read you what I said. This island history of time. Today, for the first time, I saw Kayak Island. The fabled island that the Russian explorer, Vitas Bering, landed when he voyaged to Alaska in 1741. Suddenly, I was face to face with our own history of change, a change of profound nature, far reaching for our native people of this state. I found myself being quite inwardly 
emotional. I felt like crying and laughing at the same time. I even told someone that this island that we were, that we were looking at had Im important, profound implications in and on our history. I did not elaborate to the person as to what I said, but elaborated inwardly to myself. I was mesmerized and amazed at the very island that ushered in the new people who came to our quiet world. I tried to imagine what they thought or found in themselves as they landed for the first time on our shores. Suddenly, I was there, 259 years later, looking straight at the same island, this island of history time, that which we call Ayak in our language. I wanted to shout to everyone, to all of the 1,200 passengers of the Holland America Line. I wanted them to know the immense sense of history that they all seem to be casually looking at. And I wanted all these people from many nations to feel what I was feeling, that the first contact was in my very blood and deep within my feelings of who I really am, a Central Olympic person, an Alaskan native, a participant in our history. I wanted them, and all of you here this morning, to know that we all are still here. June 23. 2000 on board Holland America Line. <laughs> Thank you. I want to start with a modern piece here. This is from Nunavak Island. What you're looking at is a muskox. And around the muskox are fish. What is the mask telling us? We want plenty of fish. We want lots of fish to come because we need you. We implore you, please come to us. We cannot hope to survive without you. So therefore, we put them on our masks to beseech these animals to come to us in plenty. So that's what it's telling us. The rings around the mask in old Yupik, traditional Yupik, what we call Samok. Samok. Sa is the very consciousness you and I possess at this very moment. It's a precious thing. Sa is the very air that we are breathing. Sa is the very ground we stand on. That's why we call our earth Sahbuk in our language. Sa is the universe we know to be out there somewhere. Can you kind of see the progression? All in one word in our language, and those rings around all of our masks is what's being said through them. We are all looking through our own consciousness. And in many respects, we are the center, each of us, of the universe. Uh, together, each of us is the center of so that's, I just want to walk you through some of the elements of our traditional uh, designs. This piece is very 
There's this mask that you can see the eyes, but it's a fish. We're saying, fish, please, come to us. We've made you here. We implore you to be in plenty. We cannot survive without you. So here they are. It's loose, it's missing plumes. One, two, three. There's the trinity. Four feathers, it's missing now. I'm going to walk you through real quickly our Yupik numerology. We have three, which is our trinity. Four is the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Five is our digits, our grasping hand, our industry. Seven is the combination of three and four, making it the powerhouse of a number in terms of the big ancient magical numerology. Seven is a powerful number, three and four combined. We have Trinity before the Christians brought to us our sense of Trinity, so when they brought the sense of Trinity, we said, oh, okay, we can deal with it. So, so we dealt with it. So a lot of our feathers in our masks are not just stuck in there willy-nilly. They're very carefully counted and uh, carefully placed. And we've been counting lots of missing feathers in the, in the collection. Every, in most, in 99.9 .9 cases, it's all within the Yupik numerology. Three, four, five, and seven. The way they are stuck into the masks. All right. So the new people came with new, wonderful, interesting concepts. And one was a notion of reading and writing. So immediately our chroniclers, our visionaries, our dancers, our uh, people who carry on a sense of history created this next song. It's called Reading the Big Book. I open the big book. I read the pages of this big book. Here's this teacher sitting next to me. So I'm going to continue to read the big book. I walk around on the tundra. I pick my berries. But there's this teacher sitting here. So I continue to read the big book. Kaliki hallo na pelinga kaliki hallo na pelinga Lots of books in the library. Kaliki Hallo, Nakir Liga, Kaliki Hallo, Nakir Liga, Arnachpaka Kula, Aya, Aya, I'm going to go berry picking. Yugi yama ayaga drena ayaga harla ikfarakla arnachpaka puma ya ya more books to read kaliki harla na kirlinga kaliki harla na kirlinga arnachpaka puma I'm going to learn how to write. Ha, 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 in Latin. Ha, ha, in a trick down lots of things to write. Ha, ha, that's a Ha, 
running around and putting caribou hair into all the missing parts. <laughs> See, they're very sad, missing all their proper plumes. But museums are waking up. They will eventually allow us to put back the proper plumes, as they should. So, enough said on that. These are from our river, from my river. Again, caribou hair, bird quills, and bird down. What you're looking at is the night sky, and these are stars, which we call in Yupik, Agriet. Those are night stars. But they're much more than night stars. They are also called Anud, snowflakes. There's a third term associated with these. In Yupik we call mchuchtak. It's snowflakes laden with our tears. We cannot forget the hard times, the times of starvation people went through. So these are visual cues for us to remember those times. So we, we take care of things. So all those cues are attached to these pieces. They're not just decorative. They are beautiful as decorative pieces. But they're profound for those of us who look at them and think of all those terms associated with them. By the way, this is a little raffle. Here's a little cover in the back which goes into it here and put a little pebble into it. And when the dancer dances, it's raffle. So it's a raffle dance. In Yupik, we call that kasaputa, the raffle dance. This is the belt for the women, made of caribou teeth. But how many caribou? family caught over generations with the new with the new uh, beads. Uh, we call those Nakugutbelt in Yupik. Real absolute all of the above belt and every other belt won't do because that's the real one. And we men have these belts with seal skin and with the wolf, wolf, uh, wolf's uh, tails. Each family had certain animals attached to them, birds, foxes. Um, my family just happened to have a wolf as a part of our helping, helping spirits, if you will. So we wear these. What it's, what it's doing is giving me stamina to dance. I could be here several hours dancing. <laughs> yeah. I'm dancing for you. I am moving for you. I am dancing for you. I am moving for you. And if you don't find that to be quite enough, <laughs> I'm going to mix a big bowl of Eskimo ice cream and serve you. How's that? <laughs> and that's just the way it is, says the song. <laughs> it's a fun, yippee song, kind of a ditty. In a way. Oh, by the way, we we have more flavors than Baskin and Robbins, <laughs> <laughs> including fish liver ice cream. I'm not kidding you. 
greatest ice cream ever was fish liver. <laughs> it's an acquired taste, actually. It's a, it's a wonderful ice cream. Avala we come can naya we come can Avala we come can naya we come can ya hey hey ya hey ya ya hey ya ya hey ya hey ya hey ya Avala we come can naya we come can Avala we come can naya we come can Ya hey ya hey ya hey ya hey ya ya we come ke and na ya we come ken Aula we come ke and na ya we come ken Ya hey ya hey ya hey ya 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 this there's no ending to the song Avala we come ke and na ya we come ken. Avala we come ke and na ya we come ken. Ya hey hey ya hey ya 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 ya. You know uh, that's traditional aerobics. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you fit. I want to talk about this piece here in the back. It's the celestial kayak. Kayak. The kayak is in the form of balloon is traveling through space and time. But then there is no time in Yupik. There is no time. It's right this moment. It's traveling through space, leaving a wake in the universe. And you see the plumes and the stars accompanying the celestial kayak. It goes through our Yupik cosmos. And the little figure in the back is the little spirit helper. Uh, it's the walrus, uh, it's walrus, what we call him Yua, the human, the human element of the walrus who is helping this kayak uh, navigate. Behind it. Yeah. You have a QA in the end also. So she's still recording, <laughs> <laughs> listening to everything we have to do and say. Again, my words be true. She's been with us in many places recording our uh, presentations and our dances. I brought one more publication that I would like to read a few uh, passages from it. In the 70s, we asked all our elders what they thought of all the change in the Yupik realm. And one of them says, does one way of life have to die so another can live? These are the words of my elders. These are hard questions sometimes we have to ask. Some of the words
thousands of years before Christ was born, we were living with the sea, getting our oil from seals, drying sand in the summer to have food in the winter. We do not care to change the world. We just want to bend the course of history enough to allow life to continue in our region. These are the words of my elders. These are the concerns of my elders. It is our conviction that the Yupik way of life can be saved and only our young save it. We do not dislike Western civilization or white man. We simply treasure our young and our culture. It is our belief that both can live together side by side, but not necessarily eating out of the same You know, I was sent off to the East to get educated as a young student. But by then I had lived a lifetime with my grandmother in many respects. And this next quote has always been very poignant uh, for me and for our young people. It's a hard one to, uh, to ponder. The elder said, when they come back educated, they are no longer the same children that we once saw leave for school. Some of them are strangers to their own people, but much worse, they are strangers to themselves. So we take lessons from the hard words that our elders said to us. So when it was published, we, we began to realize the gravity of, of keeping this alive, the collections in museums and the words of our elders and uh, the things that are important for us. Museums are caretakers of our civilization's best. You are equipped, you know, here, you have climate control, make sure that they're taken care of properly, you conserve them, and fix them if they need to. In fact, I was privileged to fix this belt on this trip. Some of the beads had, the string broke, had broken, and uh, so I repaired it for this museum. Uh, that's a privilege handled and fixed this piece, this very piece. So uh, 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 we need to be cognizant of those things within the museum uh, culture, that those of us who prize these pieces must have uh, access. And we all know uh, access is everything in terms of the Last song my grandmother taught me, I will use it as a conclusion to conclude the program tonight. See, when my grandmother got elderly, uh, she was moved to my mother's house, my mother's house. And uh, they moved her big bed into uh, my mother's house. You know, when we were growing up, we were allowed to jump up and down on grandma's bed because we couldn't do that at mother's house. You know, that was her big bed. We all kids would jump up and down. She would, Nunokasak we call it. Nunok means to scold us. <laughs> <sighs> well, 
One morning, I, I used to serve her uh, coffee every morning. Uh, and uh, by the way, Grandma drank the whole carrot every morning. Mm -hmm. She literally did a whole carrot of coffee. And I'm going to do that until I'm 95 myself. <laughs> um, I heard her singing in the room. So I went next to the room looked in, there she was on her bed, her eyes closed, singing away. So I sat next to her bed. You know, I thought I, I knew, I thought I knew all my grandma's songs because I had learned them all, but this one was a new one, which I'd never heard before. When she got done, I said, Grandma, I never heard you sing that before. How come? She said, well, she suddenly remembered it from when she was a little girl, her mother took her to a great feast, which we call Kalukak in our region. And the song was one of the songs uh, which was part of the feast. It's a, it's, a song, it's a song of thanksgiving. Thank you for my librettes. See, when we grow up in the old days, we received librettes as ivory or whatever. Thank you, for I see into the distance, for my nose septum decoration. In the old days, we used to pierce the septum of our nose and dangle semi-precious stones or beads or whatever as decorations. And all my beautiful necklaces, says the song. What the song is really trying to tell us is that when we grow up, and become um, contributing members of our society. We receive ornaments of responsibility such as librettes or jigwigs, or no septum decorations, or beautiful necklaces. So we ought to be thankful for all the responsibilities bestowed upon oneself.
<laughs> but again, our questions are reasonable. Yes? I'm sorry to be the first one no to go. No problem. But Tuna, you, you've been studying the collection so intensively for a few weeks now, and you've studied collections all over the world, in New Zealand, in Hawaii, in Greenland, in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in other places, in Alaska. You've commented several times that you've come across things that you have not seen anywhere else. Um, not all, but a lot of that was in collection storage. Could you, would you like to share with any of the folks here some of the things that you saw that were most profound for you and <clears throat> unique? Unique pieces are, are part of the work of our traditional people because of the artistry that we have had for centuries. I did tell you about the blueprints, the base of how we create things. But above and beyond the blueprints, artists in any culture uh, can innovate, create seemingly new things, but using old forms. <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, the messages are the same. One of the tableaus we looked at today, a model of a qazgi, of a, me, uh, a ceremonial house, was very astounding to me. The figures were painted, uh, their heads and faces were painted with uh, white uh, clay. And I suddenly, and I'd never seen that uh, before in any of the models that I've looked at, I suddenly realized, wow, this is a uh, special dance. They painted their face completely with white um, clay, and they would take uh, soot, uh, outline their features. Grandma, this is what Grandma described, that particular dance. And they would crush cranberries and touch it to their lips to get a bit of the red from the can cranberries. Mm -hmm. And this special dance was reserved and danced for the moon. It was done during um, autumn, which now corresponds with Halloween, incidentally. And uh, in Yupik, uh, our Halloween is called Ka Ka By the way, our Halloween lasted five days in the old days. And people were dressed up. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, so when modern Halloween was brought to us, we said, OK, we can deal with it. <laughs> it was very similar to us, the same type of deal. Our gifts were given food was exchanged, and people dressed up, and, uh, uh, and, and as such. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'll get to you. Yes, um, yes sir. If it's, if it's not too personal, you, you were, it mentioned uh, that you went to back to East Coast Village School and did an education, and then you read that excerpt about the elders commenting that people come back changed. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering how, when you went time I came home from school in summer, and then I, in those days when there were float planes, there were uh, people landed on the river on float planes at home. We now have uh, runways. <laughs> uh, so I came into the village. I scrambled out of the plane. I couldn't wait to see my family. And I scrambled up to my grandma's house, but she wasn't there. She, she was meeting with her uh, other uh, friends, the other elders in somebody else's house. They told me where she was. And so I ran up there, and I burst into the house. And they all looked at me. And one of the ladies said, the dancer is home. <laughs> See? It was very reaffirming to me. I am the dancer, and I am home. That's what she said. Hold that dear to my heart. The dancer is home. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's how. You had a question? Um, the, the clay tradition of Nelson Island is so unique to Alaska. I mean, it just, we don't see it anywhere else. And Which one? 
the clay tra tradition. It's Cusco. You see Cusco the clay. Tree. Yeah. And when I was doing an oral history project with Rita Blumenstein, she told me that she used to gather the clay on Nelson Island with her grandmother, and they would mix it with caribou hair to give it rigidity, and then they would make the dyes for the grass for the basketry in there. And before, us, before they fire it? Yeah. Okay. Where is this from, Chuna? This know? is Cusco Quim from my it's river. From the Cusco Quim, yeah. okay. From our river. But it's really unusual. We, yeah. don't, we just don't see that much clay tradition here. Because very little bit survived. Yeah, yeah. She, said there, she said there's a woman's mountain on Nelson Island where they, yeah. the women would go and gather, only the women. Gather the clay, special clay. Iku, I told you, is the term. My grandma said also the slip mm -hmm. of the clay mm -hmm. was fish slide mixed with uh, scales. That was a slip, she said, yeah. before, they, before they burned it in the open fire. So she told me some of the elements of the production when I was a kid, and I remember that going, oh, that's weird, putting fish slime onto the clay before you fire it. I remember that. So the slip was a uh, fish slime and fish scales in the, that you saved uh, when you were uh, cutting fish. So every, every animal, even the slime was saved. <laughs> so every bit of the animal was utilized. And it, they had to. They had to. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I've always noticed that uh, Native Alaskan dances are often repeated three times, and I would wonder why that is. Well, if it's three times, it's in that Trinity idea. Mm -hmm. We have th we have the tr Yupik Trinity, mm -hmm. at least from my standpoint. I don't know the others. I can't speak for them. They would have to speak for uh, what their does the Trinity numerology mean? in Yupik. Uh, yeah, I just explained a bit of the numerology in Yupik. What does yeah. the Trinity mean in Yupik? Trinity in Yupik, we have a positive and a negative, all of us, and then our dahnak binds it, our spirit, all the three. Mm -hmm. We can be good and we can be bad. And then there's a dahnak that binds us together. That's our trinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Thank you. When, yep. If you, uh, hopefully you'll come back to the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Okay. So what, what is on the list to repair next? What are we talking about? <laughs> other than all of the feathers and the plumes. Other I want to run around and put all the feathers in. <laughs> all the masks, all the missing feathers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, yeah. But masks, but one, one step at a time. We'll start with the stars. I want to put the stars back into the mask because they loom large uh, in, in, the, in the masks. Many of them almost in all the cases occur in, in, in the three, three stars. Um, so that would be important to, uh, to put back the stars on our masks. And uh, they'll wake up. I guarantee you that. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Chuna. Oh, thank I've, you. I've never been this close to you <laughs> when you were performing. Yeah. I've seen you perform in Anchorage many uh -huh. times, and I realized how grateful I am of your influence on the cognac in the Aleutic people, because you got them dancing. Oh, you know what happened? I wanted to tell you the little story. Okay, thank you. They, they took our troupe, our small troupe, to Kodiak years, years ago. When many of the elders were alive, those who spoke uh, Alutir Tanya, some of the old elders. So I sat down and I said, okay. So I took a big piece of paper and I wrote down on one side of it, all our Yupik terms in dance. And I asked the elders, how do you say this? And they would say it and they'd write it down. And you know something? They were like this. And, they, and everybody said, oh, oh, we're the same, okay. 
And we all start dancing together. That's yes. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming.